and the Eastern Church organized itself along the form of patriarchates, along national patriarchates. So there is the Greek Orthodox Church, the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, the Romanian Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, there are different patriarchates. The, the, patriarch, the patriarch of um, Constantinople, Istanbul, um, still has special authority of, um, over the other patriarchs, but not the same kind of authority that the pope has over the bishop. It's not, not, not direct authority, as in the case of the bishop, okay? Of, sorry, of the pope, the bishop of Rome. Now, the second important split, I should say that the beliefs, the theology of the Western Christians, Catholics, and the Eastern Christians, Orthodox, are pretty much still to this day the same. Okay? Not exactly the same, but very much the same. It's pretty much a, what is called a schismatic separation. They consider each other schismatic, separating from, from the church, but not denying the beliefs of the church. Okay? Um, now, the next large split within the Christian church takes place in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure you've all heard of Martin Luther, the initiator of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther was a Catholic priest and a monk of the Augustinian order in Germany, and he was also a professor of theology at the University of the city of Wittenberg. In 1517, he nailed his famous 95 Theses, his 95 points for the reform of the Catholic Church, I should call them more accurately. Um, he nailed those theses on the door of the church of the um, castle of Wittenberg, which was the way university debates were carried out in those days. There's nothing special about it. Okay? And um, Luther did not intend to start a new branch of Christianity. No, no, no. He wanted to remain a Catholic. He just wanted the church to purify itself, to be pure, to end all kinds of corruption, to reform itself. He had been to Rome and he had seen all of this corruption in there and how the popes were living like great lords of his time and um, how he found that to be very unchristian. And so um, he wanted the church to, to purify itself. Um, you may have heard also of the, the controversy over the indulgences that led at least partially, to, this, uh, to the Reformation. What is an indulgence? Well, now we, can, we need to get into um, an issue of Christian theology. We need to do a little bit of Christian theology now to understand that. Okay? The idea in the traditional Christian church, and still today, the Catholic church, is that when a person dies, his soul or her soul will, uh, will go to one of three places, heaven or hell or purgatory. Purgatory is a place of purge, of cleansing. Okay? Now, cleansing, that spiritual cleansing, takes place through suffering. Um, why is that? Well, because um, any, any improvement, there seems to be this universal law, if you wish, that any improvement, any betterment, Anything that, that's worth something requires a payment, so to say, in the form of suffering. I mean, if you want to be, if you want to be in really good shape, if you want to be in good shape and healthy, what do you do? Do you lay on a couch, eating chips, drinking beer and watching porn? Or you go to the gym and work out and sweat it out? You go to the gym and work out and sweat it out, right? If you want to get a good grade, what do you do? You study hard. If whatever you want to do which is worth something, for some reason, on all levels, it requires a payment 
in the form of effort, which, which in the last line it means suffering, right? Whatever you want to achieve, even if on a very simple economic level, you have saved whatever, $10,000 or $20,000 with great effort throughout your work of years because you want to buy this new Toyota that you've seen, whatever model, or BMW, whatever it is, okay? And then finally, you have the money, you've gathered the money, and you are going to buy it, and you pay it. But you're giving, giving that money out is suffering, isn't it? You're giving all that effort, all those years of savings, you're giving them out in exchange for what you want. You know, if you want something, you have to pay for it, and that payment, whether it takes the apparent form of money or, or physical exercise, really comes down to some form of suffering, self-renunciation, always, okay? So, um, if you want to avoid purgatory, let's say, if you die in mortal sin, unrepented, you go to hell. But if you say you've sinned, but you still, you know, you, you repent, but you still have to pay for those sins, uh, you will have to go through some stage of suffering of some sort, which is what purgatory is supposed to be. You can avoid going to purgatory um, by paying for your sins in this world. How do you pay for your sins in this world? Well, you suffer. You put up with the sufferings that will come to you regardless, your disease, loss, all of this. Or you actually inflict suffering on yourself. Or you give money to the poor. You give money to, other, to people. This act of generosity involves self-detachment, which is suffering. Or the church said, well, or you can give money to the church because the church represents God. So if you give money to the church, that will pay off for your sins too. I will eliminate time in purgatory. Those were the indulgences, okay? And um, the problem is the church got a bit too much into it. And that money was being used not particularly for spiritual reasons, but to build the Vatican palaces and the Vatican monuments and all of this. The Vatican as we know it today, okay? And there was, uh, there was a lot of abuse that was taking place with the indulgences. Now, <clears throat> the indulgences and the very idea of um, eliminating time in purgatory, reducing your time in purgatory through your effort, paying off for your time in purgatory, really responds to a notion of, I would call it spiritual economy, spiritual accounting, really. This is a matter of accounting on a spiritual level. Um, I'm sure you've heard the word atonement too, right? The atonement. What does that mean? What is the atonement? Well, the atonement really means the payment with a big capital P. Uh, it's the payment the word which is applied to the payment that Jesus, that Christians believe that Jesus made for the sins of the world. And again, this is a matter of, of sheer economics and accounting on a spiritual level. The idea was that there was a, a, a spiritual imbalance that had to be paid off. Um, what's your name? Jason, say Jason borrows $2,000 from me because he wants to make an investment and he thinks it's going to go really well and he's, it's going to pay off, blah, blah, blah. And it, it doesn't happen. Okay? It's, just, it's a very bad investment and, and he loses all the money. He invested and now he owes me $2,000. Then a number of things can happen. He will have to work extra hard, extra hours, to get that money and pay it back to me, which is suffering. Or maybe he'll, he'll ask you to, to help him and he'll collect the money, he's made collect and get the money from all of you, in which case you will be giving out. It was a little suffering on each, on each of you to, to give him the money. 
or he will ask his father or his best friend to give him the money and give it to me, or I may forgive him the debt. But if I forgive him the debt, I am suffering the, debt, the loss. In other words, the debt will not go up in smoke. The debt is a real loss, and someone is going to have to pay for it. Someone is going to su suffer that loss. Well, it's himself through his extra hard work, his father or you guys or I by forgiving him. But the debt will not go up in smoke. That's the idea, okay? Well, remember when we talked about um, um, natural law and we said that that's the moral law? Well, the idea behind natural law is that it really is part of a larger scheme. Oops. And that scheme includes the very laws of physics, which are blindly obeyed by inanimate things. So this book obeys the law of gravity, and it doesn't rebel against it, it blindly obeys it. The instinctual laws of the animals, sexual um, instincts and self-preservation and feeding, and we have those instincts too, and animals obey those laws instinctively as well. But then, with rational beings like us, there is this moral law which can be obeyed or disobeyed, the moral law. And that's what we call natural law. But natural law is part of, I mean, the laws of physics are part of natural law too. Okay? So it's all part of this, this larger scheme. Now, imagine that, that inanimate objects refuse to obey the laws of physics. So I drop this book and the book says, hey, you know what? I, I, don't, think, I don't think this is right. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna fall this time. And the book stayed floating in the air. And the same, whenever you do anything, things begin to rebel. That would create a cosmic, chaotic situation, right? The whole thing would be, we wouldn't live in such a place, right? Well, that is exactly, that's the idea behind the atonement and sin, payment for it. That's exactly what has happened with, with natural law. That part of the law that we, can, we are free to obey or disobey. We are disobeying, we're violating all the time. And so that has created a cosmic imbalance. And that imbalance, like with any bank account, has to be balanced out again. Someone has to pay for it. Someone has to pay that debt created by sin, that imbalance on the spiritual account. And that imbalance is huge. We couldn't pay for it with our efforts. It had to be either forgiven by God, meaning God had to suffer the loss himself, or it couldn't be forgiven. It would go to hell. Right? And so um, the idea behind Christian theology is that since God forgave that debt, he had to pay for it. He had to suffer the loss. And that suffering is what you see in the crucifixion of Jesus. So it is that crucifixion and that torture is the payment. Of course, Jesus being God, his suffering is worth more than any human suffering. It's enough to pay for all the sins, past, present, and future. Okay? That's the idea. That's the meaning of the atonement. Now, the idea is that God also left room for human contributions to that atonement. So you can contribute your own sufferings, your own self-detached acts of self-detachment to purge your sins, to pay for your sins, or to pay for the sins of others who may be in purgatory. So there is this transfer of merits. Because with Jesus, of course, there was a transfer of merits. He suffered it, but his merits applied to other people. So if that could be done with Jesus, it can be done with your merits as well. That's the belief today in the Catholic Church. And that was the belief in all of the Christian church before, before the Protestant Reformation. Okay? Now, it's important for you to understand this, these ideas, okay? Because these ideas will be denied by the Protestant Reformation. With Luther and his... Okay, we had a little technical break, so to say. So we'll uh, continue now. Uh, there were some reformers who were more radical than Luther, um, such as John Calvin, um, Ulrich Zwingli, Menno Simons, um, Calvin is particularly important for us uh, because, as you will see, his theology will be the basis for um, 